Morning, everyone. How we doing? Good. Good. I, these guys are always coming down for trainings that we have in the Quad Cities, and we often have 9 o'clock meetings, and we had to get up. We had to leave at 3.45 this morning, so I, I understand why they're always grumbling about it. So if I seem a little, little off, I mean, I've had plenty of coffee this morning. So um, thanks, Dan, for having me up, and uh, thanks for everyone coming this morning. Um, you know, there's plenty of topics that I could discuss this morning thought a lot about you know what was most appropriate to, to discuss and I guess over the last couple of years I've seen some rootworm issues in fields where we shouldn't expect rootworm issues necessarily and I don't know it's a little bit alarming that I think we have some problems building with some of the traits uh, out there in the market and I kinda want to talk to you about what my experience has been over the last couple of years and if we are having some trait failures you know, what are some other management tactics that we can use to um, overcome some of the issues that we may have seen. And I'll be completely honest with you, and I, I tell Dan all the time I feel terrible about this. I spend way more time in, in kind of southeast Iowa and northern Illinois than I, than I do up here. And it's not because I don't like you guys. I love you guys, actually, and I love Dan, too. But it's just, it's the four-hour difference. So I don't get up here as much. So what I'm going to talk about today is kind of what I've seen in eastern Iowa a lot. And you guys have a lot of continuous corn up here, so I'm going to speculate some of the th same things are happening up here. So, Okay, so uh, my observations and opinion is that in some environments, uh, corn that's even traded with multiple transgenic rootworm traits may uh, be having some issues develop with trait efficacy. Okay, and I, the, you know, another point that I want to get across today, this is kind of the summary of all, what I want to get across, is that switching from company A to B to C isn't going to fix the rootworm issue. So going from, you know, let's say Bravant to DeKalb to a Syngenta product isn't going to fix the rootworm issues you have. And I'm going to kind of walk you through why that's the case. Um, and then I want to kind of review some old tried and true rootworm management tactics. Uh, most of you are probably uh, familiar with some of the, the management tactics we have to use for rootworm uh, in the absence of traits, but I think it's a good time to kind of review what else we can do if we are, uh, you know, having some trait issues. And then lastly, I'm going to very briefly mention SmartStacks Pro, which is a new transgenic event that uh, Bear has developed, but Rich Judd is here today, um, and I'm sure Rich is going to go into a lot more detail of what SmartStacks Pro is and how it works. So I'm basically just going to mention that it's coming and uh, what we can do to protect uh, the longevity of that trait. Um, first, I want to kind of go through uh, some of the, the, the the problem with rootworm, you know, the problem with rootworm is, is that it's overcome lots of management tactic, tactic in history. It's, it's overcome uh, uh, insecticides, it's overcome crop rotation, and now we're seeing it overcome uh, um, traits, right? So rootworm is a, a very voracious pest, and uh, back in 2002, a group of scientists estimated between yield loss and what farmers have to do to what farmers have to buy and spend to protect themselves against rootworm they estimated back in 2002 that it's a billion dollar cost to the american farmer and with inflation it's probably you know a billion point three by now so it's a it's a major major pest of corn and continues to be a problem so uh... rootworm started to become an issue all the way back in the nineteen fifties kind of originally came out of colorado and western um, western nebraska uh, since then, you know, back in 1963, you know, so about 13 years after rootworm became a big pest, it had already developed resistance to chlorinated hydrocarbon insecticides. And I clearly wasn't around in 1963, but from my understanding, these chlorinated hydrocarbons were broadcast applied on the soil surface and then incorporated. But rootworm quickly uh, overcame that uh, insecticide. In the late 1980s, we, we understood that uh, rootworm had been able to overcome rotation with soybeans. So we had the western corn rootworm variant, and we had the northern extended diapause variants. So they were able to figure out 
uh, somehow that we rotated uh, corn with soybean and uh, I'm not going to get into today but kind of the understanding of how they did that is actually a really interesting story and if you'd like to talk more about that um, I can kind of give you a little little what I know about uh, how rootworm were able to do that. Uh, back in 19, uh, 1998 uh, we first identified that uh, methyl pyrethron insecticides were failing and then in 2015 um, we also identified that uh, some rootworm populations in Nebraska were overcoming pyrethroid insecticide um, insecticides and then in the mid to late 2000s we started to see resistance to Yilgar rootworm trait followed by Agusher rootworm trait and now uh, it appears that they've also became resistant some populations have also become resistant to Herculex rootworm so man Somehow, a rootworm uh, has figured out to overcome a lot of these management tactics. So, uh, just want to remind you, you know, thankfully to traits, a lot of us haven't had bad rootworm issues for a lot of years, and that's a great thing. But when we do have rootworm issues, it's a big yield robber. So this is some data that was put together by the University of Illinois, and you can see there's a lot of variation in this figure regarding yield losses from uh, rootworm injury, but on average we expect to lose about 28 bushel per per node destroyed, per, per root node uh, destroyed by rootworm. So it's a big deal, right? 28 bushel yield loss is a, is a, is a serious concern. Um, if you have severe rootworm feeding, you could be talking of, you know, nearly 100 bushel yield loss. So um, it's, it's not something to mess around with. Let's talk about kind of the beginning of rootworm becoming resistant to uh, transgenic traits. So back in 2000, 2011, a, a uh, entomologist at Iowa State, his name is uh, uh, Eric Gassman, I believe his first name is Eric, he identified that some rootworm populations in northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, uh, northern Illinois had become resistant to the yield guard rootworm trait. And probably the more alarming thing is that not only were these populations resistant to the yield rootworm trait, they were also resistant, they were, they were cross-resistant. So the Agashir rootworm trait and the Duracade rootworm trait were also, those populations were also resistant to that, those traits as well. Because they were similar enough that when the rootworms were able to resist the Yilgar rootworm trait, they were also cross-resistant to the, to the Duracade and the original Agrashear rootworm trait. So um, three of the four traits were knocked out uh, just because of, of that circumstance that developed and what happened there. Um, and this, this data down here is just kind of showing you uh, some of that data from that original publication. I won't bore you and get, in, get into that today, but uh, we lost basically three traits uh, with those populations of rootworm. So Yilgar rootworm was gone with, with those rootworms, with that population. <clears throat> Agarshear rootworm was gone. Duracade rootworm was gone. Agarshear rootworm was gone. And the only thing we had left was Herculex rootworm. But in 2016, uh, there was another paper published showing that some populations of rootworm we're now resistant to Herculex, the Herculex rootworm trait. So, um, you know, we know that some populations of rootworm are, res are resistant to all these traits, right? So that kind of leads me to the next part of my discussion. So in 2020, we obviously had the Duratio, right? And that that was coupled with high rootworm populations and pressure. So I ended up walking a lot of fields with our um, DeKalb agronomist, Nicole Steckline, uh, down in eastern Iowa, and we had a lot of rootworm issues. And it was unclear um, if it was true resistance to the Smartstex trait or not, um, but there was significant feeding. Yes, the populations were high. Um, perhaps the populations were so high they were able to just overcome the traits. But I also speculate and strongly believe that, that there was some resistance, at least building, to the smart stacks traits, okay? Follow that into this year, um, 
I happened to get called out to go look at a lot of corn that happened to be traded with chrome, right? So chrome are the AgriShare rootworm traits plus the Herculex rootworm trait, okay? And this is actually a picture from a couple of those fields that I was in. So obviously you can see that there's a lot of root lodge corn here. Uh, this was some of the chrome uh, corn roots that were chewed on. You can see that they're just demolished. Um, I mean, there was significant, significant root destruction on these plants. And this wasn't just in one field, this was in four or five different fields that, that uh, I was called out to look at, and I was looking at that corn with some pioneer agronomists in some cases. So because of this and my experience in 2020, I do believe that in some places we have resistance to hybrids with multiple rootworm events. Not just, you know, not just chrome, but I think that could be happening with smart stacks too. Um, okay, now, the, the good news is, is that, you know, there were some very specific environments we were finding this in, okay? Number one, the environments, this is my personal experience, all these fields were at least eight years continuous corn. Some were longer rotations than eight years, but it seemed like when we had problems, they had been in corn for at least eight years, okay? Um, the other bit of good news is that, you know, not every population of rootworm are going to be resistant to these traits, right? So, so we, we believe that rootworms are developing resistance independent, populations are developing resistance independent of one another. In, in other words, you can have one field on this side of the county with the right circumstances, the right crop rotation perhaps they were using the same traits continuously, that population has become resistant to those traits. But that doesn't mean that a population on the other side of the county is also resistant, okay? So these pockets of resistance are, de are developing independent of one another. And the, the other bit of good news is, is that in general, we don't think rootworm adults move that far when they hatch, okay? So in general, we think that rootworm adults tend to stay within a couple miles of the field that they hatch in. In fact, we believe that many rootworm adults lay eggs in the same exact field that they, they hatched in. So that means that if you have a field neighboring, let's say that you rotate with soybean, and you have a field that's neighboring a continuous cornfield that has resistance, then potentially your population could also become resistant to traits, even though you were doing the right thing. But the good news is if you have four or five fields separating that population, it's not highly likely that this population is going to move into your field because they don't tend to move that far. Yes, they get blown around by winds, storm events, but even then it's not likely that three or four beetles that are resistant to multiple traits are going to add enough genetic material to your population to really alter the genetics of that population, right? So. The message is, is that if you're rotating soybean, if you're, if you're rotating traits, if you're doing all the things that you need to do to, to resist population buildup, you know, a lot of this, the destiny is a lot, a, lot of the, a lot of your destiny is in your hands, right? Because this isn't water hemp. It's not being, they're not being distributed by combines. They're not being moved with tillage equipment. They're more isolated to where the resistance is developing. So that's really good news. If you've been doing the right thing, as long as you don't have a field that's neighboring one of these populations, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape, okay? So I want to make it clear that there are pockets of resistant populations, but it is not by any means across the entire state of Iowa. But this is something that you need to be cognizant of and watching out for. <coughs> Okay, now I want to transition a little bit into, I'm going to talk about, you know, what are the factors that, that cause rootworm populations to, you know, be higher or lower, and then we're going to uh, move into a little bit of the management, okay? So, no, number one, you know, I, I often get asked a lot, well, you know, don't, don't, won't, won't a cold winter kill a lot of the rootworm, uh, you know, a larvae and eggs? 
And that is true to some extent. You know, uh, winter temperatures do have an effect on survival. But the problem is when we try to predict populations based on winter temperatures, the prediction typically isn't all that great. And that's because winter temperature is modified by tillage. So in other words, if you are a no-tiller, you tend to have uh, greater survivability because there's a little bit of protection from uh, freezing temperatures. If you have snow cover, uh, even if you have a really cold winter, that tends to give, give the rootworm uh, eggs and larvae a little more insulation. Um, and like you guys are in this year, if you, you're a little bit wetter now, but let's say you have a really dry fall, right, and you have large cracks in the ground. Rootworm adults will try to lay their eggs in moisture, okay? So in a dry year, they could be laying eggs as deep as 12, you know, 15 inches if they can because they want to lay their eggs in moisture. So the fall moisture conditions will dictate a lot how deep those eggs were laid, which will dictate overwintering survivability. So yes, winter temperatures have an effect, but it isn't a very good predictor of the populations for the, the next season, okay? Probably the better predictor of rootworm populations would be uh, spring moisture conditions. So if we have a really wet spring, that's typically not good, but one of the benefits of a really, a really wet spring is rootworm adults <laughs> are rootworm larvae, if they're in saturated soils, that will severely reduce their populations. They literally don't have enough oxygen and will die. So if we have a wet spring, that's not a good thing, but one of the ulterior benefits is that definitely has a big effect on rootworm populations, and that's fairly predictable, okay? Um, the other, you know, the other thing I want to mention is that in my experience growing up on a farm uh, north of St. Louis, Missouri, and just my experience in the industry and kind of what we know about rootworm, you, you, you won't tend to have a, a large, long-lasting population in sandier soils, okay? So even in continuous, continuous corn, you don't tend to get a large buildup of uh, rootworm populations in sandy soils. And that's because the, the, the soil is so abrasive that it, it scars up and cuts up the exoskeleton on the rootworm larvae and oftentimes it, it kills them, okay? Um, where you will tend to have long-lasting, sustaining populations of rootworm are silt loam, silty clay loam soils. Think of those best class A soils that typically raise good yields. You know, those are the soils that rootworms tend to survive really well in, those silty, silt, silt loams and silty clay loam soils. You know, that's where they'll tend to have, you know, pretty decent survivability. They, they tend to be well-drained, tend to be easy for the rootworm larvae to move around in. Those are the soils that you have to be concerned about. Okay, so when I go through this, I'm just going to make the assumption that traits aren't effective okay or or they're becoming less effective so again I hope this is a this is mainly review for everybody but what are some other tactics that we can use to control rootworm uh, populations obviously rotate to soybean okay that's you know that's well known and and that can help a whole bunch and I'll tell you I got a story that I'm gonna tell you and then and then I'm Bottom line is crop scientists know from doing studies that even rotating one in every four years can delay resistance development quite substantially. So it's not like you have to be in a corn soybean rotation to delay resistance. Even, even throwing a soybean crop in there one out of four years can help a whole bunch, okay? But I'm gonna support that with a very recent story. So I was with a farmer this spring in one of these instances where we had bad root lodging are, are bad corn lodging from rootworm feeding. And uh, we've been looking at, at, at chrome hybrids most of the day. Uh, this farmer uh, also uh, purchases some channel corn and it happened to be traded with smart stacks. And the chrome corn was down very bad, lots of rootworm feeding. And there was a, there was a field next door that had also been in corn a lot, okay? Uh, the chrome field had been in continuous corn for almost 20 years in this specific instance. And I said, well, you know, what about the field next door? How long has it been in, in you know, continuous corn? 
He said, ah, you know, we, we plant corn in that field a lot. I think it's been in soybean uh, two years out of 20. You know, not very much, but we, we've had soybean in that field. In fact, there was soybean in that field four years ago. We went and walked in that field. There were some rootworm adults. There was some feeding, but nothing like what I showed you in this slide. Was it the smart stacks trait? I don't know. Or was it the fact that um, it, it had soybean in it four years ago? I think that's a possibility. I don't think that population of rootworm was probably had the level of resistance that the, the field right next door um, had because it had never seen soybean in 20 years. Is that true? I don't know, but I mean, that's a personal story and observation that I've made. Um, I'm going to tell you another story, and this was actually with the same farm, or actually the same two fields. So I was called out there because he was up working on his grain leg, and he noticed that across this entire 130-acre field, every once in a while he could see two rows that were down across this entire field. And he, you know, he knew his root lodged, but didn't know exactly what was causing it. So I went out there and looked at it with him. And as what we concluded after walking this field is that row 16 must have had a problem with the insecticide box. So we actually put insecticide on top of chrome corn in this field. And the insecticide was working beautifully, except for on row 16. <laughs> so when he went down and doubled back, he had two rows that either didn't have a full rate of insecticide or the insecticide wasn't being placed properly because in those two rows there were many adults you know when you approach those rows you knew it because there were a lot of adults flying around and that corn was down severely and had a lot, lot of rootworm feeding on it so that also reminded me that boy insecticide works when it's when when the right type of insecticide is used and when it's applied appropriately when it's applied inappropriately it doesn't work right so point is is that you know granular or or an infrared liquid insecticide still can do wonders um, even with with high larval populations okay and we we probably all know this but just in general you know the granular aztec the granular the granular force the granular fortress those are all great products and do an excellent job on uh, you know killing rootworm larvae and protecting roots Liquid Force is also a great option. Um, Force CS was a formulation that was around for a lot of years. One of the problems with Force CS was it wasn't compatible with all starter fertilizers. There were some compatibility issues. Within the last couple of years, Syngenta has released a new Liquid Force. It's called Force Evo. And the reason they reformulated it is specifically to be compatible with starter fertilizers. And if you go online to the Syngenta website and find the Force Evo page, they have a list of about 50 or 60 different starter fertilizers that, they, that, that they've done compatibility testing with. I have, I have personally used Force Evo with R6246, have had no issues. 6246 is also on the Syngenta website as being compatible. Um, so I feel much more comfortable with Force Evo from a compatibility issue um, through my personal experience. And it does an excellent job too, which I'm gonna show you here in a minute. What I would not do, if you're specifically trying to control rootworm, is use Capture LFR, Liquid Capture LFR, or Poncho 1250. Both of those products do have some efficacy on rootworm larvae, but not nearly as much as Force Evo or the granular insecticides, okay? I mean, those products are very good for secondary pests like wireworm, white grub, grape collapsis, they do an excellent job on that. And they do give you a little bit of control on corn, corn rootworm larvae. But if you have resistance issues and you have that high populations, that's not going to be the answer. Okay. So I just wanted to make that clear because I've been on some farms where, well, I use, I use Capture LFR, I shouldn't be having these problems. Well, unfortunately, Capture LFR isn't going to give you the efficacy you need in these types of situations. And here's just some data. I, I pulled a study from Iowa State in 2008, a 2013 University, University, of Illinois, University of Nebraska study, and a 2008 University of Nebraska study. And basically, that just shows you what I just told you. So the granular Aztecs forces, the, the Inferro liquid force, all great products, Capture LFR, Poncho 1250, probably not what you want to use in a heavy rootworm situation.
Okay, now this is an opinion of mine, okay? <laughs> so I have no evidence to support this, only then my thoughts uh, and opinions. Um, you know, when you look at a bunch of uh, insecticide control studies, you know, there are some studies that compare placements of insecticides, and it's hard to beat the old T band or four inch row band granular insecticide. It's hard to beat that, okay? You know, generally you get a little better control with those applications than you would a true in furrow application, all right? But still, a true in furrow application can do a really good job. But um, I personally believe that this precision planting attachment, it's called the furrow jet, that puts, you know, some liquid material in the furrow as well as injects some liquid material about three quarters of the inch on both sides of the furrow. I think that can help get get the insecticide spread out enough that they may that that may actually start to be close to what you could get with a T band. Again, this is my opinion. Um, I ch actually tried to look at look at some studies. I'm kind of surprised Precision Planting maybe hasn't even thought about that or looked into it. Maybe they have, but I can't find anything online to support that in any way, shape, or form. Again, this is just an opinion. So, if somebody wants to try that, let me know how it turned out. <laughs> Um, <coughs> okay, so uh, the last, the, kind of the last thing would be controlling adult populations, all right? I'm just going to say a couple things about that. Um, you know, using a pyrethroid or bifenthrin with a foliar application, you know, when you're applying your fungicide, you know, that's not a bad option. Uh, the issue with that option is rootworm adults tend to have a, a very long drawn out emergence pattern, right? So just because you're applying a insecticide when you happen to be applying your fungicide doesn't mean you're going to capture all of the adults in the field, okay? Particularly with a pyrethroid or bifenthrin where you're probably looking at, you know, four or five days, days of residual at most, okay? So if you truly have a resistance issue, I'm not sure, you know, just applying an insecticide with your fungicide is going to get you what you want. You better either be trying to time that insecticide application when a majority of the rootworm adults have emerged, or you might want to look into something like Stewart, which is a new foliar insecticide on the market. It isn't a broad spectrum insecticide. It, it, it's definitely very effective on rootworm adults, but it isn't a broad spectrum insecticide necessarily. Um, and the thing about Stewart is, is it has a 14 to 21 day residual period. So if you're applying that with your fungicide, you know, now you have a lot longer residual activity with it and it's a lot more likely to get a lot of those adults. It is $21 to the acre approximately from my understanding, so it isn't cheap. But if you really do have a resistance issue, you know, something as pricey as that might not be a bad option, something to think about. Um, and lastly, um, SmartStacks Pro uh, is a new uh, trait on the market. It's gonna have a very limited launch in 2022. I'm gonna let Judd talk in a lot more detail about that. You know, but thankfully, we're gonna have a new root event on the market and hopefully it's going to help out in these situations where um, you know we potentially do have some resistance issues. I think we want to be very cautious to not just go back to using SmartStax Pro continuously and not rotating to other traits or not using other rootworm management tactics because if we do that we're going to find ourselves back in the same situation pretty quickly. I'm sure Judd's going to go over that in a lot more detail so I won't go into that anymore. The rumor mill, and maybe Judd wants to comment on this, maybe he can't, I don't know, but the rumor mill from the Corteva camp is that this trade is going to be quickly licensed to them as well as Syngenta. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've heard. So it's possible that you might be able to get SmartStacks Pro in a different seed company's bag. Again, that's just the rumor mill. But um, So with that, uh, that's all I have. Um, are there any questions for me about what I've seen or my experiences with rootworm? Have you guys seen any issues up here, Steve or Dan, or that you know of? Mm -hmm.
Shaking her heads, yes. It's yes, not sir. Not as hot as <clears throat> Nicole's area, uh -huh. but we definitely have a, a panel in the last two seasons where a um, number of issues has been Ele elevated. Yeah. I've seen, seen quite a few more uh, dropped ears. Is the corn board trait still working good? To the best of my knowledge, the corn borscht, I mean, I, I have, I don't know of any resistance reports other than I believe there were some issues down in Costa Rica or one of the places where we grow seed corn and high, you know, winter production areas. That's the only place that I know that where there's been issues. Um, but other than that, I, I don't know. I tell you, I have also seen some eardrop and... I don't know if that was just a couple hybrids I was in or if there is another issue with that. But to my knowledge, to answer your question, I don't believe there's any resistance issues with carnivore. Lead Academy. Liquor Grow. Excellence. In agronomy. Development. 